our Bibles tonight and turn to the New Testament, to the book of James. And between now and the end of the year, we're going to be studying through some different passages in James and looking about faith in particular. And tonight, we're looking at a subject that ought to interest all of us, and that's spiritual maturity. And God has taught us in His Word that His goal for us is to grow and to be Christ-like. In fact, if you want to jot down Hebrews chapter 6, in Hebrews 6, 1, Scripture says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And he's saying in that verse that we are not to stay where we are when we first become a Christian, that we're to grow, that we're to move beyond point A, and that we're to get more like Jesus as we live for Jesus day by day. And so we're looking at some selected passages of Scripture tonight in the book of James that really teach us about the biblical meaning of, of spiritual maturity. I want to begin by sharing with you uh, some things that spiritual maturity uh, is not. Uh, today, a lot of people have a misunderstanding about spiritual maturity. So let me tell you what it is not, according to Scripture, and then I'll tell you what it is. But we look at what spiritual maturity is not. First, the Bible helps us to understand that uh, spiritual maturity is not age-related. It has nothing to do with how long you have lived. It has nothing to do with how long you have been a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be a Christian for 50 years and be very mature in your faith, or you can be a Christian for 50 years and still be a baby in your faith. So spiritual maturity really has very little to do with your age. Now, God's idea is, of course, as we get older, that we grow in our faith, that we mature in our faith, but that's not always the case. Here's something else to remember. Spiritual maturity is not based on appearance. Now, some people look very wise and, and very dignified and, and very spiritual and you might think that they're holy because of the way that they look, but don't be surprised by that. It has nothing to do with appearance. It has nothing to do with the way a person looks. In fact, if somebody's trying to look spiritual, that's a pretty good indication that they're not. So don't be uh, fooled by that. And then maturity has nothing to do, spiritual maturity has nothing to do with what you have accomplished it has nothing to do with uh, really what you have accomplished. You can accomplish a lot in life, be very successful in life, and still be spiritually immature. And there are a lot of people that would fit that description. You don't have to be spiritually mature to make millions of dollars. You just have to be smart and have some business sense, but it has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. And then spiritual maturity has nothing to do with academics, and, and we need to understand that. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have or how much education you have obtained when it comes to spiritual maturity. You remember when you graduated from high school? I bet you thought you knew it all, didn't you, when you graduated from high school? When I graduated high school, I thought I knew it all. I went to college and found out I didn't know very much. Went on to seminary and found out I knew even less. And when I went to a, another seminary and got in their doctoral program, I found out how, how much I really didn't know. And I used to say that if you have a doctorate, that just means you know more and more about less and less until you know a whole lot about nothing. And so uh, God is not impressed with those academic credentials. You can have so many degrees that they call you Dr. Fahrenheit, and it makes no difference when it comes to this thing of spiritual maturity. Well, let's look at what Scripture says that spiritual maturity is. And in fact, write down one word on your outline. The word is attitude. Attitude. Spiritual maturity can be measured by our attitude, our Christ-likeness. If you want to determine your level of spiritual maturity tonight, don't compare yourself with other people, but compare yourself with the Word of God and what God says about being spiritually mature. And it begins with Christ-likeness. That's what spiritual maturity is. It's being like Jesus. So now the temptation is when we have a study like this and we begin to talk about 
spiritual maturity and spiritual immaturity to, to think about everybody else you know that fits in those categories. Uh, try not to do that tonight. Instead, think about your own self. Uh, do a personal inventory. Ask the Spirit of God to just speak to your heart. Don't be thinking about anybody else. Just let God speak to you as we move through some of these things tonight. And I'm going to share with you some characteristics of spiritual maturity. All of these are in the book of James. In fact, the book of James is a manual on spiritual maturity. It's the maturity manual in the Word of God. And in this book, you will see the word perfect used in all the chapters. We're going to look at it four or five times tonight. The word perfect means mature when James use it, uses it. Perfection means growing Christ-like. It's talking about our attitudes, meaning spiritual maturity. So what are these characteristics of a person who is spiritually mature? Well, turn to James chapter 1, and let's look at the first one, verses 2 through 4. James 1, verses 2 through 4. My brethren... Now, the word brethren there just simply helps us to understand that this is written to believers. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. You see the word perfect, circle that. Maturing work, that you may be perfect, that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So here we see that a uh, spiritually mature person is positive under pressure. That's the first characteristic. Think about your own life. Are you positive under pressure? That's a mark of spiritual maturity. James talks about all the trials that we're going to encounter and endure in life. Christianity, by the way, is not a religion. Christianity is a life. Jesus did not say, I've come that you might have religion. What did he say? I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It's something very real between you and, and God's Son. And so what is your natural attitude when things don't go right for you? When you encounter the trials and the troubles of daily living, are you negative or are you positive? Are you basically a supportive person or are you skeptical and suspicious? Is your life filled with gratitude or is it filled with grumbling? All of these questions help us to take inventory in our spiritual life and see how we're doing. Are we positive under pressure? Look at verse 12 of chapter 1. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So you can be great in the knowledge of the Bible and still be cantankerous as, as all get out. The question is, are you positive under pressure? When you go through the trials and troubles of life, do you see evidence of spiritual maturity in the way you respond to those troubles and trials in life? The first mark is being positive under pressure. Here's the second characteristic. Turn over to chapter 2 in the book of James and look with me at the 8th verse in the second chapter. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Now what's that about? He's telling us here that a, a, a second characteristic of spiritual maturity is being sensitive to the needs of others, of caring about others of loving your neighbor the way you love yourself. You see, a person that is spiritually mature will begin to see the needs of others and will put other people before self. A spiritually mature person is not just interested in, in self. Now, you see babies or children when uh, little children are immature. In fact, you can put two children in the same room, put one child over here, give him a box full of toys, put the other child over here and give that child one toy. And which toy does this child who has all the toys want? This one over here. You know why? Because they're immature. 
And so spiritual immaturity is much the same way. It's an indication that we're more concerned about ourselves than we are anybody else. It's called selfishness. It's called pride. But a mature person, on the other hand, James is teaching, is sensitive to the needs of others. But James gets really specific here if you look at verses 1 through 6 of chapter 2. Let's read through them. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool, Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts and on he goes. And he's talking here. Pardon me a minute about not showing partiality. And he's teaching us that a spiritually mature person is sensitive to the needs of others, will not ignore the, those who are underprivileged, those who really need help. Well, let's look at a third one. Turn to chapter 3 in James, and we see a third characteristic of a spiritually mature person. In verse 2, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a what? Thank you, Mike. He is a perfect man. The word there is mature. He is a mature man. Now look at it. We all stumble in many things. Can anybody give me a testimony on that? We all do, don't we? Amen? I know I do, and I imagine all of us do. But look at what it says. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, a mature man, able also to bridle the whole body. What's he talking about? He's saying a a person who is spiritually mature is one who has mastered their tongue. They have mastered the tongue. Self-control, write this down. Self-control comes from tongue control. We get ourselves into so much trouble by what we say. And if you look at chapter 3, James begins to give us examples, illustrations. He says the tongue is like a rudder. It's like a bit in a horse's mouth. It's like a spark, a snake, and a spring. You put a little bit in the horse's mouth and you control the direction of the horse. You take that little rudder on a boat and you control the direction of the boat. And the tongue... When you compare it to the rest of the body, it's very small and insignificant. And yet, it can build up or it can destroy. It's a little member, but it has great power. It can encourage or or discourage. Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, I just say what's on my mind? (laughs) You know anybody like that? Well, Uh, They just say, I'm just going to be frank up front. I'm going to say what's on my mind. Maybe there's not a whole lot going on. Uh. (laughs) The Bible says that's not frankness. Understand that. That's not frankness. That's immaturity. Did you get that? Amen? When you say something like that, you're just revealing your spiritual immaturity. So James teaches us that we ought to watch what we say and don't say things to to just build yourself up, build other people up. I mean, people need encouraging today, and it helps to encourage others. So try that tomorrow. Whenever you run into somebody, try it tonight on your way out. Uh, Tell your brothers and sisters something that will be encouraging to them. Build one another up. That's a mark of spiritual maturity. But now, and I'm not talking about insincere flattery. I'm talking here about genuine, genuine, uh, I'm trying to find the word for it. I guess 
genuinely trying to encourage somebody by speaking truth to them in love. Everybody's got some good points. I've known a couple that came close, but everybody really does have some good points. And dwell on those good points and try to encourage them in the Lord. And that's what a mature person does. James says a spiritually mature man, a spiritually mature woman manages his or her mouth and that if we can't master our mouth, it's an indication of spiritual immaturity. Look down at verse 26 over in James chapter 1. James 1, 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Now look at this. If we memorized a hundred verses of scripture and we went to every Bible study we could go to and we went to church and we never missed a service, but we could not control our tongue. The Bible says our religion is in vain, that it's, it's, it's useless. It's doing us no good. So this is very practical. Scripture says that if we're going to be spiritually mature, we're going to be Christ-like. And Jesus mastered his tongue. Now let's look at another one. Turn over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Now he's talking about judging others. And he's telling us that a A spiritually mature person is a person who does not judge others. What about you? Do you judge others? Do you uh, tend to to be quick to, to do that? Paul said to the church at Corinth, well, frankly, Paul said to them that he told them they were a bunch of babies. They were spiritual babies. They were judging others. They were judging one another. And he just called their hand. They argued about everything. They argued about the Lord's Supper. They argued about their spiritual gifts. They argued about leadership. Everything. And it was a mark of their own spiritual immaturity. And James tells us here that there are two reasons that we do that, that we judge other people. And one of the reasons is selfishness. And how do we know that a person, how can you tell tonight whether you're spiritually mature or immature? Listen to the way you pray. Listen to what you say when you pray. Our prayer life will reveal our Christ-likeness. Our prayer life will reveal our our attitude. And if our prayers are always self-centered, if it's always, Lord, bless me and mine and use me and help me and it's all about me, And that's an indication of spiritual immaturity. But if your prayer life is focused, and it's all right to pray for what you need. It's all right to pray for yourself. But if that's the focus of your prayer life, it indicates spiritual immaturity. But if your prayer life is intercession, the bulk of it, if most of your prayer time is spent praying for others, then that's an indication of spiritual maturity. Selfishness, and then there's pride. Pride guarantees Uh, spiritual immaturity. Look at James chapter 4, verse 11 and verse 12. James 4, 11 and 12. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? Now, why should we not judge others? Why are we not to do that? Well, number one, we're not God. And when you judge somebody else, you're playing God. Because you don't know the motives of anybody's heart. Only God does. And so we're really usurping his authority. He says there's one lawgiver, God. Second, only God has all the facts. We don't have all the facts. And third, the motives. We don't know each other's motives. So only God has the right to judge. He knows everything. He can see into the heart. 
and he knows the truth. So what are these tests tonight? These tests that will help you see where you are in your spiritual life. How do you handle problems? That's the first one. Are you sensitive to other people, the needs of others? Can you manage your mouth? Do you judge others? And certainly, all of us have room to improve, and and this message is not designed to depress you tonight, but simply to help us all understand that we all fall short, and there are areas in our lives where we can, can all be convicted and where we can all improve on our Christ likeness. I want to close by telling you a story. There was a man named George Thomas who was pastor in a small church in New England. One Easter Sunday morning, he came to the pulpit carrying with him a rusty cage, bird cage, bent, old. He set it down by the pulpit. And eyebrows were raised at first when he brought it in and set it down, and then he started to speak. And he said, I was walking through town, and I saw a young boy coming toward me, swinging this birdcage. And in the bottom of the cage, there were three little wild birds, shivering with cold and afraid. He said, I stopped the boy, and I said, what have you got there, son? And he said, just some old birds. He said, what are you going to do with those birds? The boy said, I'm going to take them home and have fun with them. I'm going to tease them and pull out their feathers and see if I can get them to fight each other. I'm going to have a real good time. And the the preacher said, then you'll get tired of those birds, son, and what will you do with them when you get tired of them? He said, oh, I've got some cats, and they like birds, and I'm going to give them to my cats. Well, the pastor was silent for a moment, and he looked at the boy, and he looked at the bird, and he, the birds, and he said, Son, how much do you want for those birds? The little boy said, Mister, they're just plain old field birds. They're not worth anything. They, they don't sing. He said, They're not even pretty. How much? The pastor said. The boy sized the pastor up, and he said, How about $10? The pastor reached into his pocket, took out a $10 bill, put it in the boy's hand, and in a flash, the boy took off. The pastor picked up the old cage, carried it to the end of the alley where there was a tree and a little grassy spot, and he set the cage down and opened the door and softly tapped on the bars of the side of the cage until the birds jumped out, flew away, free. Well, that explained the empty bird cage on the pulpit, but then the pastor began to tell this story. He said, one day Satan and Jesus were having a conversation, and Satan had just come in from the Garden of Eden, and he was gloating and boasting, and he said, yes, sir, I just caught the world full of people down there. I set me a trap. I used some bait. They couldn't resist. I got them all. And Jesus said, what are you going to do with them? Satan said, oh, I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to teach them how to marry and divorce each other. And I'm going to teach them how to hate and abuse each other. And I'm going to teach them how to drink and smoke and curse and gamble. I'm going to teach them how to invent guns and bombs and kill each other. I'm really going to have some fun. And Jesus said, well, what are you going to do with them when you get through? Satan glared very proudly and said, I'm going to kill them. Jesus said, how much do you want for them? Satan said, oh, you don't want those people. They're no good. Why why do you want to take them? They'll just hate you. They'll spit on you. They'll curse you. They'll kill you. You don't want those people. Jesus said, how much? Satan looked at Jesus and said, all your blood, your tears, your life. Jesus looked at Satan, and he said, done. And he paid the price for you and me. The pastor picked up the birdcage, walked off the platform, out of the pulpit, and the people stood in silence. For God loves us.
Let's be Christ-like. Let's stand. Father, now as we come to the invitation, we pray that your spirit would search our hearts. And Father, as we have examined our own level of spiritual maturity or immaturity, we pray that we would be quick to confess where we fall short, that we would humble ourselves before you. And we thank you that your grace is marvelous and sufficient to cover our sins. We thank you that you paid the price for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.